All right. Can I have you uh, state your name and your rank and where you served? Okay. Thomas W. Carneal, or better known as Tom Carneal. Mm -hmm. uh, I ended up as an E5 after three years. Um, I went to uh, Fort Sam Houston to um, Med Lab Tech School. Now, don't ask me why they signed me there, <laughs> but I guess I was pretty good. And then uh, I didn't quite finish. I was in the top 10 and they had too many people said, all right, if some of you will step forward and volunteer uh, to not take this last month, we'll guarantee you we won't go into Korea. So I stepped forward and I went to Germany. <laughs> and I was assigned to the 15th Evacuation Hospital, which was, uh, well, it was a tent hospital we could set up and take care of 500 patients. But we didn't do that except in practice. And so what I ended up doing more than anything else is going TDY to different clinics and hospitals around West Germany for 30 months. Okay. Also, we need to uh, get your birth date and place of birth. Okay, April 8th, 1934, Minor, Nebraska, which basically doesn't exist today, so it's Flatsmouth. <laughs> okay. Could you spell Minor? M-Y-N-A-R-D. Okay. It was a, uh, it grew up around a railroad. It had, uh, at one time when I was small, it had a post office and a general store and uh, a church mm -hmm. and a blacksmith shop. And today it has a church. <laughs> There's a few towns that have gone that way, haven't they? <laughs> Certainly have. Certainly have. All right. And... So what pulled you towards the military in the first place? Did you enlist? Well, my name um, in Nebraska at that time, as I recall, it had a wheel and your name got put on the wheel. They spun the wheel and picked out a name who's going to be drafted. And usually they did this about 90 to 120 days before the draft date. And... Uh, there were nine of us that went through high school together. We were on that wheel, all within the same age group. And guess whose name came up? Mm -hmm. So I had the chance to either take my chance and, and be drafted and go be a foot soldier or enlist and maybe go into one of the schools. And that's what happened. I ended up with, and why I went to med tech, I, well, they told me because my IQ was good. <laughs> 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 so anyway, and it, it was pretty good because my time in Germany, I uh, worked in different hospitals over there. I spent uh, um, nine months at 10th Field Hospital in Würzburg. It was a big general hospital and worked the lab there. And then I also uh, was at uh, Stuttgart, I think the fifth general. And then I was at... Uh, uh, Heidelberg, but I don't, I think that was called the 225th, I'm not quite sure. Different hospitals, different groups. At that time, uh, maybe getting ahead of myself, but what we were really, we were taking care of uh, soldiers that got injured or needed operations, but we had a lot of OBGYN for the wives, but we were really, you know, uh, scared to death the Russians were going to come across and and uh, we were all lined up how we do this uh, line and that line and that line and push us back into France or we'd push them back into Poland, <laughs> you know, whatever was going to happen. Fortunately, none of it. Mm -hmm. So was that your greatest fear then was advanced by the Soviets? Oh yes, that was, we practiced, I mean, uh, we'd get a call in the middle of the night or early in the morning, middle of the day, and you'd drop what you were doing, get your battle gear on, get in the trucks, and go to certain designated spots. And uh, there, there was a real fear of the Russians coming across. And at one time, I had a, <laughs> I had a job of going out and collecting water 
in the different guest houses, the different bars that GIs would go to, making sure the water was safe to drink. And I had a Jeep and a driver, and <laughs> this was crazy. It was right along the Czech border, and there was that fence there, mm -hmm. and there were the Czech soldier walking with his gun right across the fence, and there we were in our Jeep, right on the other side of the fence, waving at each other. <laughs> it's like, you know, we're gonna shoot each other, but we're waving each other today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's always that threat there, but yep. you, you wouldn't want to... Uh, well, I don't think... Over. You know, I remember that so vividly, thinking they don't want to go to war anymore. I mean, we want to go to war, but then we never know what the hot shops and the capital are going to be doing. So what ranks did you have, and what units were you assigned to? Well, uh, the entire time I basically that I was in Germany... I was in the 15th evacuation hospital, but then I did TVY to all these other hospitals. And my rank came through uh, the 15th evacuation hospital. In fact, I was away every time I was promoted. I was away and I, and, uh, I either, well, one time, I guess when I went from, I guess, uh, I think that would be speak from private to corporal, uh, I was in Würzburg, and when I was promoted uh, up to Special Sergeant, uh, it was it was Special Sergeant uh, Special Five. Um, the uh, lieutenant from the 15th Vac made the drive over and uh, gave me my promotion papers. That was very, very unique. I thought, well, there were three of us there that were being promoted, but uh, they were very happy how we performed and and were very proud of us uh, representing the unit. Because mm -hmm. we were stationed, we're, uh, our 15th evacuation hospital was at a little town called Muschweiler, which probably, I'm not sure, but I would say it was a half mile or a mile from the French border. We were up in the mountains, and uh, it's like we were the last unit in Germany, what the idea was. But mm -hmm. uh, as I said, I got stationed all over on TBY. What was your living conditions? What type of barracks or? Oh, gosh. Uh, at Würzburg, it was a brand new hospital they had just built. Now today it's leveled, it's been torn down, but it was brand new and so we had like a, a ward that we had for our barracks. And it was pretty much uh, double rooms because they would be hospital rooms if needed. Mm -hmm. And uh, I happened to have a good met a buddy there and we shared the room and there was a bath between our room and the next. So Four of us had one bath. It was pretty, pretty luxurious mm -hmm. living in that respect. When I was transferred to Würzburg to 10th, um, they had no facilities to live in. And so I had to live on, or I got to live on the German economy. I had to go find a efficiency apartment and uh, they paid me a per diem. Uh, I could eat at the hospital. That, uh, if I wanted to walk up there every day, I didn't. I found a place not too far, but I could walk to. But uh, for eight, nine months, then I lived in this house with a German family. I had, I had a room and shared the bath. <laughs> and then uh, in, uh, when we were at Stuttgart, it was an old Nazi hospital, very, very, Fancy. Uh, it was winter time. I remember because we could walk from building to building, to building in tunnels. We never had to go outside. I thought that was really fantastic on the part of Germans the way they built that. Of course, I think they built it in part so uh, if there was any type of a bombardment or anything, they, you know, they could get by. I don't know, but it was uh, good old German uh, architecture from pre World War II. And uh, in Heidelberg, it was 
uh, as I recall there, it was modern, but not new. <laughs> Uh, it, I never really had, except for bivouacking, <laughs> I really never had bad living conditions in Germany. I had to eat on the economy from time to time, which was fine. Mm -hmm. uh, I learned a lot of German, which I've forgotten <laughs> because I didn't practice it, but uh, I never went hungry. You mentioned that you lived with a German family. What was that like? interacting with that family and interacting with other Germans? Uh, that was a very interesting experience in the respect that the mister was an old uh, German soldier, uh, infantryman, and, um, but he served on the Eastern Front. And so he thought Americans were good, Russians were bad. We, he didn't communicate a lot uh, <laughs> interesting, I have, to, I have to tell you this, uh, the room I had had uh, double windows out towards the street. Well, sometimes on Saturday I'd go to the market and I would find maybe fresh oranges or something and I'd, in the wintertime, I'd put them in between those windows to stay cool. Well, I did that a couple weekends and then he let me know not to do that that didn't look nice from the street, mm -hmm. and he didn't want anyone to know that, that I was really living there, I think was what it amounted to. Now, Frau, uh, Frau Sattis, um, she was very friendly, very happy-go-lucky, uh, wanted me to, uh, well, I could use her kitchen if I wanted to cook. I, I seldom did anything other than maybe on Monday, Sunday morning, heat water for instant coffee, <laughs> but uh, she was she, she was a very friendly. They were they were very nice to me as far as that goes. In fact, all the Germans I worked with were none of them had it seemed like any animosity towards the American GI, even though had been through the war and had been through hell, uh, and I'm sure that many of our GIs maybe in 1944, 1945, weren't the best to them, but they certainly were nice to me. How was your feelings being there? Because just a few years earlier, we were fighting against the Germans. Right. Were you conflicted? Not really. Maybe the thing that happened almost from the first day, uh, there was a German nurse that worked in the hospital lab where I worked, Frau Wiesman. And um, she was just very, she was very pro-American, even though she had worked with the German army during the war. But she did a tremendous job of any question I had about German culture or exposing me to aspects of German life if I would as for instance, uh, on Christmas Eve, she asked if I would like to go to a Lutheran church Christmas Eve service. Now I thought that was very nice, and I did go, mm -hmm. and I did enjoy it immensely, even though I had a little problem with the language, I certainly understood. And I think she did a nice job of educating me about the war's over, we have to except that we lost and Americans won, or the Allies won, but it was always Americans because we were in the American sector. And uh, just, just very, very accommodating about uh, teaching German culture and food ways. And, and of course, she was very efficient in uh, the laboratories that we were working there was uh, another gentleman that worked in the hospital in Würzburg. He was a dishwasher, and he had been just an infantryman in World War II, but he had been captured by the Soviets, and he had spent a couple years in the Soviet prison. And he, uh, he always said he was so, I'm not sure if I can express exactly how I said it, except he was, so sorry he got captured by the Russians, not the Americans, because the Americans treated the prisoners much, much better. <laughs> and, 
And so he, he was very pro-American as far as that goes too. So do you think that that made a difference in the Cold War, how prisoners were treated during World War II? I really, I really don't know. Can't speculate on that. Okay. Uh, so how long exactly did you serve in Germany? From what date to what date? Uh, I think like May 7th, 1953 to probably September 15th, 1956. Okay. So you enlisted right to i volunteered avoid, yeah to, to avoid being uh well being I sent didn't, to korea i didn't want to be a foot soldier in korea right. and since i didn't have any college education i figured that's where i would end up mm -hmm. now uh i i wouldn't have and i'll tell you why when i finished basic training i already had this uh, letter saying I would be going to Med Lab Tech School at Fort Sam Houston. But when I went in the like the final day, they said, all right, you're going to be reassigned to uh, a supply corps here in uh, uh, Fort Riley. So I would have ended up being uh, in a supply clerk, I guess, instead of Med Lab Tech. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, uh, they honored the the letter, and I went, and it, it helped me. I uh, at that time, well, I was eighteen. Um, I had dreams of I'd always had dreams of going to college, just didn't have the money. But I thought I wanted to go into medicine, and I did use my med lab tech after I got out, and I gonna I put myself through college with my med lab tech experience and GI Bill. Yeah. Uh, so while you're serving in Germany, what what did you know about what was going on in Korea? What was your attitude towards the war? Well, I think the only thing, the thing I remember more than anything is the grunt. I mean, you're walking in mud, up, and you know, I don't. I guess you've been to the. Korean uh, memorial in Washington, D.C. And you know, the only thing that memorial lacks is the real mud flashing up from those guys walking through there. And I had an uncle that was a paratrooper from World War II. And he always said, do anything you can do to avoid being a grunt, being a foot soldier. And so that's probably what caused me to enlist rather than being drafted mm -hmm. and going the way I did. Prior to the war breaking out, how much did you know about Korea? Did you have any of it in school or? Well, in school, no. What I knew about Korea, I um, we had a, in the hometown of Plattsmouth, Nebraska, where I was at that time, we had a um, barber that was, uh, that my barber, that was, uh, World War II vet, and you never sat in his chair but what he didn't tell you what was going on in the war somewhere, mm -hmm. uh, Korea or whatever. It was military talk all the time. That's all he ever did. And uh, it, 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 <laughs> there was nothing appealing about Korea. Uh, in the news or here people talk about it or anybody that came home. There was, now, like you, I've been to Korea since then, and Korea's a different country than, I'm sure it wasn't Korean War, but it was a different country than they pictured to me mm -hmm. in 1950, 1953. So tell us about uh, when you went to Korea, what was your experience then, what was your impressions? Well, I was, <laughs> the thing I remember more than anything else, because I have lived in China and been to Japan many, many times, and, India, blah, blah, blah <laughs> all over. But the thing I remember about Korea is the number of church steeples that you saw when you went into the city. You don't see that in other Asian cities. And I was just, maybe that was just so, I don't know, I was just so shocked by, by that. Uh, 
I thought the people, when I was there, uh, just friendly as could be, and uh, helping this old stumbling Westerner uh, ordering food or whatever he was trying to do. I just, uh, it just was quite a different experience and had, I had a very nice time there. When was that? Oh boy. <laughs> uh, you can approximate if you want. It probably was around 1990. Okay. Uh, somewhere in that business, about, because I became chair of international studies out of university in 88. So it was about, about 18, 1890, 1891, or 1990, 1991. Yeah. And you mentioned travels to Japan and China. Was any of that were, was that all related to historical studies then? Well, uh, we, the university here had an exchange program with the international studies program in Beijing, China. And uh, their faculty would come over here to Northwest to take a master's degree. And then in turn, some of us would go there and teach different things. I went, uh, I applied out here and uh, <laughs> I went with the idea that I was going to teach uh, American history uh, to uh, a group, and I got there, and uh, it, and that was an experience in itself too, because <laughs> of storms and planes not making it on time. Anyway, we, uh, the first day I met with the faculty, we said, "Well, now you're going to teach a course in uh, Western civilization and uh, Christianity." I said, "What?" I don't, that's not my field. Mm -hmm. Well, yes, you got to. I said, oh, can't we do something else? Well, you have 500 people signed up for the course. <laughs> 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 so uh, they had the, they had the massive number of students had this big lecture hall. And every Saturday morning from 9 to 12 for a semester, I, I started basic Christianity, what I, that was not my field, but I learned a lot. <laughs> and the smartest thing I ever did, and I'd say this to anybody, when they said, you've got to teach this course. And I realized, oh, and the library there was, you know, almost non-existent as far as material. Fortunately, the British library had a few books that I could use, but don't ask me, why, but the first day I went in and introduced myself and said, you know, this is what the course is about. Now you write me five questions that you would like to know about Western society, culture, Christianity. Smartest thing I ever did. It took me the better part of three days to fart through all of that. Mm -hmm. But I organized and took, you know, 20 people asked the same question that I knew that was an important one and I organized the course in response to their questions. And I had a tremendous response to, uh, the, to the semester. And I, I don't know how much good I did, but I did. <laughs> you just have to do the best you can. It's interesting where different paths will take you where you never expect it to. <laughs> oh, absolutely, yeah. And I never, never in my life did I think I'd be at faith with that and without the books to back it up, but I did it, yeah. What about Germany? Have you been back to Germany? Yes, uh, about three times. And of course, the Germany today is nothing like the Germany where I live there. But, uh, you know, the thing, uh, one thing I was impressed with when I was there, uh, we're talking about the 50s, was the train system, it worked pretty well. Well, today it's one of the most efficient systems in the world. But uh, I have to tell you that the first train ride I took or the first time I went out to go from our little community immune trailer up to Kaiserswater and not on a Saturday to get a, away from the barracks, uh, rode in third class. Now, we would call them cattle cars because that's exactly what they, <laughs> they were, just 
box cars with wooden seats. <laughs> now, of course, they don't exist anymore in Germany or anywhere else, but that, that was my first experience on the German railroad. <laughs> but we got there and got there safely, yeah. And I, uh, the other thing that, uh, of course, <laughs> certainly Eisenhower was, and I, anybody else that went was so impressed with the Autobahn, because remember at that point, uh, 53, 54, uh, interstates weren't <laughs> the thing here. Uh, that had to come later, and I was just so impressed uh, with the Autobahn and, and the way traffic would flow in and out. And it's still, yet today, is quite a system here, even compared to ours. Yeah. They knew what they're doing. <laughs> so Germany and Korea are all part of the uh, umbrella of the Cold War. What reflections do you have? What's important that you're not going, that, that people should know that they're not going to hear in a normal classroom setting? Well, I think it's hard to put into words except the personal fear that you live with that war was going to break out any day or we weren't going to win this battle. You know, like just getting the news of the guys in Korea that was up at the reservoir and got cut off and getting out of there and getting back. It's, you know, it's like war's hell. And, uh, you, you lived it at that time. And of course, in Germany, we constantly lived with the fear uh, that the Russians were going to come across the border any, any moment, any day. Uh, maybe the military instilled that into us, but certainly uh, the news press did too. I mean, we, I think we, whether you're here as a civilian, there as a military man, we feared that Russian aggression at that time because uh, it, they just had not come to terms with uh, living peacefully mm -hmm. and they still haven't <laughs> as far as that goes. Are there any stories of friends that you made during basic training or anything like that that served in Korea that you'd like to share? Or? Well, uh, I, <laughs> I said an interesting thing, of course, you meet different people in the service. And when I was in basic, uh, I met a guy from western Nebraska. And uh, we got along well, and he, he it was too far for him to get home for a weekend. So I could get home if they gave me a weekend pass. I could get home and say hi to everybody and get back again. And I took him home with me one weekend, and he met my sister. Well, he became a brother-in-law. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, he ended up, uh, I believe he served 20 years, I, I think. he. I'm not quite sure because he and my sister uh, and their family, um, they were in Hawaii for a while, and they were in Korea, and then back in Hawaii. And then they ended up getting divorced, so I don't know what's happened to him today. Uh, but uh, that was probably the, oh, that was my best buddy from basic. And then when I was in Germany at the 15th Evacuation Hospital, uh, I had a good buddy there that uh, was from Florida. And uh, he went, he, he got out about a month before I did. And we stayed in contact for several years. He got married and had children. I was in Florida and visited. And then, you know, stupid things happen. You don't write mm -hmm. and you lose track. Yeah. And he had now passed away. I know that. I've been, been to, uh, he had an insurance business and kind of kept track that way. But, hey, I'm getting old. <laughs> <laughs> and things happen. And in fact, you know, it's like, uh, well, of, of those guys that were on that wheel for being drafted with me, I'm the only one alive today. And I'm the only one that served. Hmm. Does that make a difference? I don't know. <laughs> Gave me three years of physical activity. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
What question am I forgetting? What uh, What would you like to tell me that I haven't asked yet? I think um, the only thing I would sum up to say is, you know, as I look back on my service, I didn't become a professional. I didn't stay for 20 years or 25. What did I get out of my three years? Well, I think my answer to that is I, I got a tremendous boost in morality, a tremendous boost in responsibility, a tremendous boost in being honest about every issue. I, I can think of things that happened in the laboratory at the hospital that you could cover up, but no, tell the truth and it got taken care of. And I think I learned all those things, truthfully, mm -hmm. and how to be independent and take care of myself. Any messages that you want to leave for future generations? Well, I didn't have to fight World War II. I didn't have to go to the trenches in Korea. I wasn't in Vietnam. We've lost a tremendous number of men that gave their lives to protect this country and our way of life. And I hope we can remember that in the future. Sometimes it bothers me with our younger generation. Are they going to step up to the plate? I hope so. And we have, we have to have hope and we have to believe in the future. That's for sure. That's where I'd leave it. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. You're welcome.